identification of investment opportunities. Sometimes we do not make these investment opportunities readily available, accessible to the diasporians who want to invest. I think there is a really missing information gap. Uh, throughout today's sessions, we will examine the various tools that have been made available to communities to maximize the impact of such investments, as well as the importance of responding to the needs of both migrants and rural entrepreneurs. Furthermore, we are also aiming to reflect on how these investments can be used to promote sustainable businesses, create economic opportunities, establish resilient communities, and how this even more relevant in rural areas where agriculture is the main source of business. Uh, again, I cannot uh, over understate the fact that we have also very little information about diasporians and, and their investment making decisions. And I think uh, this session today is going to bring light to how we can get more information on the profile of, of the diaspora. I hope the network will be able to, to, to shed light on, you know, who are you, what are your interests, what type of returns are you looking for, where is your, where is your passion uh, in terms of, of the change you want to see. And if I recently released a report showing that over 80% of the migrants interviewed indicated the willingness to invest in the agricultural business if they provided with adequate tools. Over the years, we have tested various financial mechanisms, among others in Mali, Senegal, and Somalia, and many of them proved to be very successful. Now it's time to assess how they can be scaled up. We will delve more into the report during the sessions. As we also heard yesterday, not only do diaspora investments contribute to economic and social development in the countries of origin, but they also provide a valid response to mitigate the impacts of climate change. Low-income countries are particularly vulnerable to the effects of climate change resulting in increased food insecurity, land degradation, and subsequently economic challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, today we will continue to analyze uh, how investments linked to green energy or climate smart agricultural practices can develop innovative solutions to help and avoid further land degradation and preserve natural resources while also promoting climate resilience and adaptation. Uh, we know that climate is a big driver for, for movement. And in fact, where you don't find food, where you don't find water, uh, it's a trigger to move. And if there's no opportunities, you will do that. Finally, I would like to wish you all a series of informative and productive conversations. Thank you for your time and attention, and enjoy the rest of the event and uh, Kenyan hospitality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sara, for those opening remarks. Let's move to the second intervention of the day. I have the pleasure to invite on the stage Almaz Negash, founder and executive director of the African Diaspora Network. Almaz. Good morning. How are you? Okay, I know that it's a large room and uh, the energy is spread out, uh, but we'll try to get it up and uh, uh, start the day um, as we did yesterday. Uh, every day is different and this one is a beautiful one. So thank you for being here and thank you Mario, Sara, and everyone who has been so generous with their time and insight over the last uh, 24 hours and uh, uh, moving forward and I am very grateful to be with all of you and thank you for being here. So I prepared a presentation that I wanted to say for today but I, as you've uh, heard Sarah and others over the last uh, day, uh, they have really done a lot of the detailed conversation and I think the question I'm hearing is what does the diaspora want? Where do we want to invest our money? And so I thought that maybe I dive in into what we've learned over the years at the African Diaspora Network. Uh, we're based in Silicon Valley. For some of you who may not know, we're in California. We bring Africans and Friends of Africa together to really have a, an understanding and a conversation about the continent and the community in which we live. 
The latter is very important for the diaspora because we cannot do what we want to do, even send remittances, unless our uh, economy on the on the uh, in the countries where we live is actually good. So I think being good to both is actually what's going to make the diaspora thriving and even looking outside of uh, the places where we are so we can begin to invest um, on the continent. And what we have learned at ADN over the years is the complexity and the beauty of the diaspora. When I talk about Africa, we're not talking about one homogeneous society. We're heterogeneous and we're also 54 countries. And I think the beauty for me is actually in the complexity of the 54 um, uh, countries that we represent. And at times, if we close our eyes and start to think of each other as human being, we become one Africa or one human, wherever we are. But there are so many barriers we have to go through in order to reach that point. And so when we ask a diaspora to invest, the first thing we ask is, where is that money going? First, because we are skeptical. We don't trust easily. In order to build that relationship and that trust is what ADN is trying to bring the diasporans together in Silicon Valley, in Washington, D.C., in New York, and in conferences like this. And we do the work through partnership and collaboration because no one person, no one organization, nobody can do this alone. And I think collaboration is going to be key. The private-public partnership is going to be incredibly important. The other thing that makes me incredibly happy, especially over the last um, year, year and a half, is how many countries are so interested on the diaspora. Let me start with the United States. In October of this past uh, December, this last December, uh, President Biden had the Africa Leaders Summit. It came up um, eight years later. In fact, in 2014 is when I met my wonderful brother, uh, Johannes Asefa, who's in the room, also during ALS, the Africa Leaders Summit. We were just new, we did not know what we were trying to do at the African Diaspora Network, and then here comes something called the African Diaspora Investment Symposium. Eric Couchard, uh, Johannes, and others from the State Department were hosting. To bring it fa uh, fast forward, we have done it eight times. And so we just celebrated the eighth annual uh, um, African Diaspora Investment Symposium this past March, where we had many of you who are in the room, including Stella, at the symposium. Why am I telling you all this? Because the United States has a vested interest in the diaspora, and especially on the African diaspora. And there's a, right now uh, a plan to create a diaspora um, advisory committee that is going to be working with the White House and the State Department to ensure that there is an intentional um, uh, engagement of the diaspora. That's all good. So the geopolitical uh, interest on the diaspora, you look at the European Union, you look at China, but the, the biggest uh, winner on this, if it's done right, is the United States and Europe because they have the most African diaspora in their uh, countries. The question is how we, the diaspora, can actually take advantage of it. We're not just immigrants taking resources from any country. We're immigrants contributing to those countries. In the United States, we actually have a $55 billion in savings, and that's a very powerful money that we have. How do we utilize this and we go above and beyond remittances? And so. Um, as we do this engagement to build relationship, to build trust, because without the latter, we cannot do anything. Investment is very personal, but it's also based on trust. Do I trust the person who's asking me to invest in their portfolio? Do I trust the institution? And how do we make sure that we build that trust in order to, uh, to enhance the capacity of the local communities that we're trying to support on the continent? And I think one of the things that I'm learning at ADN, and I learn because we have to learn, nobody knows everything, it's that we're experimenting. Because this has not been done before. And the reason is we have not been very collectively advocating for what we need. We've been, we are fragmented, let's admit that. And I think it's beautiful. And so people say, well, how do you compete with the Ethiopian diaspora, with the Nigerian diaspora, with the Ghanaian diaspora, with the Eritrean diaspora? We don't compete, <laughs> we actually just, 
exist. And what's beautiful about ADN, and I think we are getting somewhere, is that the people who come, who are a part of the ecosystem, are the people who are really looking beyond their own ethnic identity. Because that's our limitation. No, for me, it's my limitation. If I just tell you I'm an Eritrean, I think that's a very, very simplistic way of defining who I am. I'm not just an Eritrean. I only lived in Eritrea for probably 19 to 20 years. The rest of my life has been outside of Eritrea. So I really belong to the U.S. community, and I contribute as much as I can to my community because that is who I am. And then above that, I am a mother, I am a friend, I am a sister, I am a colleague. So we're more than that. We're, we're more than how we define or how people define who we are. And if we want to go above and beyond our ethnic, religious, and country limitation, the abundant opportunity that exists in the, in, in, on the continent is immense. But it's also complex and it's hard. And so what are we asking people to do? I really don't know what we are asking, although I know one thing. What we are asking, and at least from our end, is let's have a conversation. Let's talk about the issues that matter to us and to our community. And so I'll bring you to some ex specific things that we're doing in order to make sure that uh, what we talk about at ADN, we're showing it in action on the continent. When we started the African Diaspora Investment Symposium eight years ago, then we saw the first two success of the convening and we said, so what does this mean? You get together, you talk, where's the action? How does it show up on the continent? What we do in Silicon Valley, what we talk about in the United States, in Europe, in other places. We came up with something called the Builders of Africa's Future. We identify locally owned, 100% African owned enterprises on the continent. We open up an application, people apply. So the first three years, we actually just brought them, we identified 10 to 15, we brought them to uh, Silicon Valley to the symposium, provided them trainings through the Miller Center at Santa Clara University, uh, provided them with mentorship, and then gave them an opportunity to pitch because we had no money to give them. Nobody was even listening that these were was investing or was giving to. Because the skepticism about investing on blacks and especially on Africans is pretty high in Africa, in, in the United States. And so we have some work to do. But let me bring you to today. Yesterday, I saw a, a newsletter from our organization. We just announced the sixth cohort of the African uh, uh, Builders of Africa's Future, 10 of them. They're from all over uh, the, the continent, uh, of which one of them is from Kenya, and in fact, she was hosting the booth yesterday. We already guaranteed and have $25,000, each one of them to receive $25,000 from the U.S. Africa Development Foundation. I'll tell you how these two things are connected. In the U.S., the Congress appropriates fund for the continent, for Africa. Sometimes you have to be lucky to find where it is and how to get access to it. We got lucky, it took us years, but we have a partnership with the U.S. Africa Development Foundation whose mission it is to identify grassroots African entrepreneurs and to provide them with the grant they need, no equity, this is pure grant, to help them sustain their businesses. This is the second year that they've given us $25,000 each and then, uh, Sister uh, Rose is one of them, and I'm very proud of you and of the people that you serve in, in your community. So we are trying, I'm not, I, I'm not saying we've arrived anywhere. In fact, we're just at the beginning of it. Ten is not enough. So the good news is we just got um, a request from another potential supporter saying, scale it up, and we will support you. When we, when we get this kind of support system, then who's holding them on the ground? Who's supporting them? Where is the infrastructure? Where's the ecosystem? And I think this is where we need the collaboration. At the bigger level, though, how do we make sure that the Africans from the diaspora also put, we look into our savings and start to say, I want to invest in this individual because I love the work they are doing. How does the money go? Who's going to make sure that there is accountability, transparency? And so many uh, different platforms are being now discussed, whether it's with the AU, 
with the Africa Development Foundation and individual private entities that are trying to create the platform where the diasporans can invest. You can't ask me to invest in one or the other. I need to make a decision, a sound decision, because we're not talking now remittances, which is very transactional. It's one way. It's two way in a way because you're giving it to your parents, to your sisters, to your friends, and you're not asking them to give you any return on your investment. But when you're asking a diaspora to give their $25,000 to put somewhere, they're going to say, what is my return on my investment and how sure am I to get this money? So what are, you, uh, what are we looking for? I kept uh, being asked, what, are you, what do you want? Well, I want to get a platform uh, that would enable me to get money uh, on my money. But only, that's just only a fraction of it. I also want to make sure that the money that I'm investing in is making an impact on the community. The latter is important. We're not just only looking at return on our investment. We're also looking at the social return on investment, the SROI. And these two things are not separate in a way because you're actually trying to make an impact with your money on the community. At the same time, you also want to make money on your money because you're not now asking remittances. You're going beyond remittances. And now you're saying, I want to be investing. That's on the diaspora side. I think then what else are we asking? We're asking for the governments to enable the to create an enabling ecosystem for the diaspora to invest, to really be innovative and creative and be able to uh, uh, do the things that they want to do, whether it's uh, I am uh, uh, interested in Kenya and in investing in Kenya. What are the uh, areas where I can invest in, in, in Kenya and who can I work with? These are going to be critical if we want to go beyond remittances, which means that we're going beyond borders too. And I think these are hard but very important questions to address, and the question is how are we going to do it? When we leave from this, what are we going to do? And I think this is the hardest thing. We travel from all over the world to be here together. We go to our own work, and work becomes uh, debilitating because you're busy, but then there is this big vision you want to accomplish. I say that we focus on the big picture, not on the mundane things that we do. They're important, but we focus on the big picture. And the big picture, at least from where I stand, is how do we support this growing youth in Africa? How do we harness the creativity, the innovation of these young entrepreneurs, and to ensure that they have a much better life than their parents? And I think if we can focus on that and look at other examples, yesterday we were talking about India, Indian diaspora. They are the most uniquely positioned diasporans to make not only an investment in the country where they come, but in everywhere they go. In Silicon Valley, the CEOs and uh, the venture capitalists, they're Indian diaspora, and I'm very proud of them. We can, I cannot stop but say, how can we reach that point? And I think the way we reach that point is by working and collaborating with them and other diasporans, because we are not the end of it all. We are actually a part of that global diaspora. How do we work with them? And so at ADN, we made intentional, intentional, intentional effort to bring the Indian diaspora into our leadership because of the fact that there is an ecosystem that exists within that community that the African diaspora can tap into. We can only learn from others and collaborate with others to make these things happen. So I continue to be optimistic, but I'm always optimistic, so you have to be very careful about what I'm saying. I honestly don't see everything that is a, a challenge as uh, something that is not we can, uh, that we cannot overcome, but although some challenges are incredibly difficult and we need help to get through them. But this is a challenge good to have. You know, if we are going to be a two billion um, continent in a very short period of time, by 2050, do we want to take that as an advantage of population, that we use the power of the people to make sure that we continue to uh, uh, promote our uh, entrepreneurs and our uh, human capital? Or do we want to use that as a disadvantage and we end up really, really um, misusing the power of the youth? Um, and, and then we say, what did we do? Why did we do this? I challenge me and all of us to think a little bit bigger be bold and ask for help to make it happen. 
we also have to be honest and uh, really authentic about this. We have a long way to go in Africa to ensure that our people are thriving. Why are we talking about remittances? We're talking about remittances because there is, no, there is a need for employment and other opportunities within these countries that are receiving the remittances. But at the point when we get out of remittances, then we will say, actually, we have arrived at a point where Gambia doesn't need any remittance from anybody because there is an ecosystem. Not only do we not need the money, our people don't have to die, and I'm going to not cry, but I just heard about the 79 people that just sunk on the coast of uh, Greek somewhere on the islands. Can you imagine how painful that is? These are probably Eritreans, Ethiopians, Nigerians, Senegalese, and others, and Gambians, wherever they come from, from the continent, and, are, uh, and from Southeast Asian countries, just lost their lives. These are the migrants that we're talking about. They had a hope, just like you and I, and they're not there. They're gone. So those are the kind of people that inspire me, but I also feel deeply saddened by what happens to them, but that's the journey we have to go through in order to achieve our dreams. So it is not easy. It's not a very straight line uh, road. It's pretty uh, fragmented, and it's kind of um, challenging and difficult, but somehow we make it. Somehow we get through it. And I'm very happy to be in Nairobi, and I think I'm seeing a lot of progress, a lot of growth. There's also a lot of need, and I look forward to collaborating and working with all of you and I continue to believe on the diaspora. And I thank the IFAD and GIFIT team for making this possible. And I look forward to our collaboration and partnership so that we don't just only talk about remittance, we also continue to talk about remittances and investment. Even though they are two tracks, they're actually the same purpose in a way you're trying to make the lives and the, uh, uh, the lives of the communities um, on the continent. So I'm really delighted to be here with all of you. And I thank you and I look forward for more conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Almaz, for your always inspiring speeches and words. So ladies and gentlemen, we have heard the keynote remarks and opening remarks by our director of IFAD and by Almaz. And now we are starting with the sequence of sessions. So I'm going to take this opportunity to invite on the podium, on the stage, uh, the first session of the day. So the first session of the day will be um, sorry, uh, investing in the future of Africa, what diaspora wants. So I have the pleasure to invite on the stage here Udo from DMA Global, who's going to moderate the panel. Stella Opoku Owuzu from Afford, please join us. Yusuf Reya from the African Jobs Network. Lee Sorensen Consulting. Please, Lee Sorensen, join us on the stage. And Alimatu Nimaga from the Union des Ambassadeurs Mali. You should see the name the tag of the organization. So without further ado, I'll give you the floor, Omolayo. The panel is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Investing in Africa's Future what the diaspora wants. Um, Almaz answered a lot of this question uh, during her talk, which is so wonderful. So I think we're done here. Let's all go home. It's been answered. <laughs> so my name is Omolayo. Um, I am a research manager and gender specialist at DMA Global, an international development firm. 
Um, I will be your moderator and timekeeping militant today. Uh, we, we will be having a, a very strict time schedule just because I don't want us to miss our coffee break again. <laughs> um, so I hope we don't mind. Please forgive me in advance. Um, we just, we have a lot to get through and it's gonna be really interesting. So today, we are talking specifically about diaspora investment, so not the person-to-person -person transfers meant for family upkeep. If that's what you were hoping to discuss, that is in the other room. Um, but here, we're gonna talk specifically about diaspora investments. Myself and many others, as Almaz and Sarah um, talked about earlier today, are of the opinion that diaspora investment come from a different pocket than they um, remit from. Right? So for example, no matter how much you tell me uh, to leverage remittances for development, I'm not going to touch the money that I send to my mom every month, okay? And what she does with that, that's her opinion. Um, and so that includes upkeep, which is essential. So today we're talking specifically above and beyond that um, to investments, right? And so our discussion today sits amidst um, the rise in attention, because it's been happening, diaspora finance mobilization has always been there, but the, the rise, there is now a rise in attention to it. Um, and so, you know, now that um, more typically uh, established diaspora are mobilizing funds for long-term development uh, through perhaps starting businesses, starting and funding businesses, buying stocks and bonds where they're available, um, and even crowdfunding platforms like we heard about yesterday. Uh, governments, INGOs, donors, civil society, and uh, even the private sector want to know how to align this interest in investment with the development needs of countries of origin, which is a really you know great question so but is this possible where and how do we find and attract these investor diaspora members and what do they truly want out of these endeavors let's discuss but before we get into it I would like to get an idea of who's in the room with us today so how many people here consider themselves diaspora members or members of a diaspora okay great um, how many of us here work in government Okay, good. Um, how many of us work with INGOs, donors? All right, and then how many work in civil society, you know, NGOs, grassroots organizations? Great, and how many of us are private sector? All right, wonderful. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, so it is now my esteemed honor to um, introduce our wonderful panelists here. So first of all, we have Lee Sorensen. Um, he is most known for his work within the diaspora investment space, particularly when it comes to uh, diaspora financing in Somalia. However, he, is also, he also works across a multitude of themes and locations, including financial access and inclusion, fund management, and holistic peace building, among many others. He runs Lee Sorensen Consulting LLC and is a senior key expert with the EU support and policy dialogue on Somalia investment climate. Um, thank you for being here, Lee. Uh, we also have Stella Opuku Owusu, who has extensive experience and knowledge of diaspora affairs, migration and development um, in policy and action. She was nominated co-chair for the Global Forum on Migration and Development, Civil Society Day 2019, and selected as a steering committee member of the UN's Migration Multi-Partnership Trust Fund. Stella is the co-executive director of Afford, where she leads their work on diaspora investment, entrepreneurship, and employment, and oversees Afford's engagement with diaspora and migrants network built, and migrants network building and training. There's a comma there. Halimatu <laughs> uh, Nimaga. Uh, is uh, down there. She is a champion of diaspora investment and entrepreneurship and a consultant in private sector development in Mali, where she coordinates several projects related to entrepreneurship, business environment, agro-industrial competitiveness with a focus on women inclusion. She contributed uh, to the creation of the Union of Ambassadors, uh, a network of entrepreneurs and professionals in the diaspora. She is currently a project coordinator for the Women Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative, Sahel, um, at the World Bank. Bienvenue, Halimatu, and Stella, welcome as well. Uh, and then finally, but definitely not least, we have Yusuf Reja, who has vast knowledge of the African job market and the challenges facing employers and job seekers in Africa. 
He's the founder and CEO of Africa Jobs Network, an interactive talent and interactive talent search platform focused on employer branding, candidate engagement, and improving the recruitment experience. Yusuf is also the founder of ethiojobs.net, deraja.com, and Kipawa, a, which is right here in Kenya, which are all part of the Africa Jobs Network. I'm so glad that we have diaspora investors and experts on the stage with us, so we should have a very rich and fruitful discussion, puns very much intended. Motivates diaspora members, thank you, is what motivates diaspora members, particularly those who might be second or third generation, to invest, um, to invest uh, in they or their parents' country of origin, and are they a different class of investors from local and foreign investors? I'd love to hear from Halimatu and Lee on this, because you both have um, extensive experience with returning investors who are a particular case as well, or are they? Halimatu, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, so to reply to this question uh, regarding the investment of third or second generation, we see that there is a big difference with uh, previous generation because uh, Africa diaspora uh, wants to, to get out of uh, its comfort zone and they want to try new adventure. Uh, most of them have evolved uh, abroad uh, and so they see that there is less room for innovation, for um, the entry of new players in the market and uh, the market is saturated so there is uh, more opportunities in African countries and so they are more open to explore these opportunities and, and try you know, the new adventure. There is also a search of uh, sense of meanings in what they are doing. So they, they have this kind of attachment to the country of origin of their parents, of their own countries, and so they are looking for uh, investment that makes sense, activities that make sense to, to, to leave some legacy and to have an impact. And this explains why uh, they have another mindset from their parents. Uh, they want to, to have more impact, while previous generation were more investing in real estate to to, to, to shake her the, um, the coming back because the idea was to go abroad to work to, to build their house in, in, um, in, in the country and then come back uh, when they will be retired but this model has changed so, so now we, we, we see that the new generation is really looking for impact rentability and, and to do a different way uh, to do business uh, regarding the second question, um, if diaspora is a second class, uh, another class of investors, I think that it is between local and foreign uh, investors because uh, they are facing the same difficulties as local investors. Uh, business environment is not as easy and as all investors, they are trying to manage risk, to mitigate risk and to, to make their company grow. So in, in this sense, they are the same but they are also considered as foreign investors and so they are facing the same difficulties. Um, so, so I will say that this is either in the middle but they are creating their own identity because um, uh, they have this double culture. They have a relationship with the country of origin but they're also uh, a product of a country from abroad. So, so and at the Union of Ambassadors we are really um, working on this aspect because we are considering that because of this double culture we have a new, a new perspective, a new vision and we can bring something for the development of, of, uh, of our countries. Um, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've been in other uh, GFR ADs before, and it's always uh, interesting. I learn something new every time, and uh, it's been very inspiring to see the evolution and the, uh, the groundswell that's happening around diaspora investment. Um, so going back a little bit, um, I identify as my own consulting company now because I'm independent and I consult with the EU. I consult with EFAD and others as well. Um, I just finished a project in Somalia called the EU Support to Policy Dialogue on the Investment Climate. So we did some work in and around investment writ large, of which some was diaspora investment. 
uh, that program ended, and so it'll be coming out in the next iteration, probably in November or so. We'll wait to see what happens there. But some years back, um, there was an initiative called the Diaspora Investment in Agriculture Initiative at EFAD. And under that program, there was a seed capital matching fund that was designed and we applied in Somalia. At that time, I ran a program, or a, a fund manager, created a fund manager called Shiraco. Um, and uh, the difficulty they had at EFAD was finding a fund manager that was um, uh, close enough to the ground that they could bring real information forward to be able to match these diaspora investments to local finance. Well, we had that apparatus in Scirocco, so we managed the fund. But as part of that, um, uh, it was a very successful fund. It's, it's been well documented. It's in a lot of reports. You can look at it and see it was a small um, grant that leveraged, the 20 percent leveraged almost 80 percent is what it was, and it was uh, uh, a certain amount had to be diaspora, a certain amount had to be local, et cetera. But we did something during that. We needed to understand this continuum on what's a remitter versus what's an invest investor, and I think it was good to carry out. They're not necessarily the same, but what we found after doing focus groups global, having over a thousand respondents and getting some actual data, creating a typology of a remitter versus an investor, is you can say, um, uh, remitters are not always investors, but investors have almost always been remitters. And so you look at the continuum, if you look at the amount that they're, they're remitting, if it's the smaller amounts, 200 or below, 100 or below, it kind of, they're not likely to be, quote, investors of the type we think in terms of investor. But as you get up the continuum to over 500 or maybe over 1,000, they're almost always some kind of investor. So the common bond is, is affinity and ties back home. So now coming to the question, um, how do you differentiate, what is the motivation for investment and how does it differentiate between the next generations? Um, it's very personal, investment is personal. I can't say I know the whole generation of, the you know, second generation Somalis that are in diaspora. But I can tell you what I've seen and in our studies and in my experience, if you look at these three questions, if you look at you know, what motivates you to invest, is it maximizing social benefit? Is it ensuring the business has taken steps to minimize risk? Or is it maximizing a return? If you have between those three questions, the most common answer, 39%, is maximizing social benefit, which is no real surprise. They want to have impact and have social benefit. But not far behind it, at 32%, um, <clears throat> is ensuring the business has taken steps to minimize the risk involved. So 32%. And then behind that is maximizing your return at 29%. So it's right there close. The two that are non-impact based are looking at having a sure investment. Now look at the composition of our focus groups. About 30% of the attendees were between 18 to 35. So they're of the younger generation of a sort than, their, than the diaspora who left during the conflict are now probably in their like 40s, 50s, 60s or, or older. Um, so they're looking more toward the core investment that has an impact to it, but they're looking more at the, I want to have a return and I want to go into something that's going to be pretty assured. Thank you, Lee. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. That's really interesting and I enjoyed the continuum conversation. Uh, okay. So we're going to move right on along. So where do we find and engage um, and incentivize these diaspora investors. So uh, Halamatsu and um, Lee have kind of given us an idea of who they might be. And then what are some of the strategies um, for doing this, particularly since diaspora themselves are so diverse, like you two have mentioned. So Stella and Yusuf, um, you both have experience with research and recruitment. Could you enlighten us a bit about finding them? That's great. Thank you very much. Um, so I think it's probably just important also to mention that uh, for Afford, I mean, this is our 30th year, um, essentially being a diaspora and development organization, engaging with the diaspora. A lot of the work that we did at the start was really about understanding how the diaspora contribute to development. And I think through that process and doing a fair bit of, of research to, to, to understand the diaspora, which also then sort of took us from the first sort of 10 years to the second year where we did a lot of capacity building. Now what I'm talking about here is about building relationships as well and building trust. Uh, and this is a way in which you also engage the diaspora. So we have had a history of engaging the diaspora in the UK and Europe and working with them. And in some ways it kind of makes our work a little bit easier. However, there is also an element of the work. We've never forgotten the think tank part of the work that we do and so we and so we basically continue to do the research as well and and the um, um, and the mapping 
So with all of our, our projects, we've always got a mapping angle, especially if the country is a new one for us. So recently, in the last two years, we've done some work in Senegal, we've also done some work in Guinea, and these are all two new countries for us. So we've carried out a mapping, it's focused on diaspora investors, and by investors for afford, we mean um, the people who are either entrepreneurs or provide their time or skills and money, right? Um, and so we focus on this group and we carry out a research to understand who the diaspora investors are. So we're looking at entrepreneurs, we're looking at people who want to volunteer, we're looking at people who want to give their time. Um, and then we look within the categories as well to identify these different groups of people who can also support the projects that we are working on. And so typically at Afford, we've had our focuses on job creation, creating decent jobs in Africa. So we work with diaspora and local entrepreneurs. The focus is also on social um, impact as well. So I think going back to the points that Lee had also made in Halimatu as well, the diaspora are very much interested in this space. It's about making an impact. And so that's where our focus on decent job creation has also been about engaging diaspora in these areas. But then we also build their capacity as well. So it's also important to understand that if we want to get a lot out of the diaspora, we also have to put into the diaspora. So we build their capacity. And these are all incentives, really, in terms of engaging them. And, and supporting them also to do a whole lot more. So just as a quick example, one of the last programs that we had was about providing the diaspora with 80% finance, uh, diaspora entrepreneurs with 80% finance for them to put in 20% uh, to help to scale up their businesses in Africa. And in fact, the diaspora ended up, um, um, I think the contribution that was made was around, it was closer to 50% than it was actually 20%. Right, and then even in terms of the skills that were shared, the time that they took out, um, denying themselves the, the, the payment and focusing on those that they were employing. And so if you were to add all of that up, it's way more than we can even actually, you know, sort of um, quantify. Thank you. You said? Right, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think if we look at it uh, in a, separately, you know, the, the first issue is how do we create the linkage between the diaspora investors and the uh, investment opportunities in Africa. That's basically the linkage. And the second one is looking at the <coughs> incentivizing acquisition of the diaspora or getting them interested. Uh, I think I'm so. Uh, in terms of the linkage, I do believe uh, there is quite a lot of uh, organizations that have been established, um, like the ETO American by Johannes, the American Diaspora, and uh, Alma's uh, association. There's quite a number of associations um, that are trying to gather the diaspora into one platform. There are quite a number of platforms, and also the technology would, would actually allow you to search for those uh, uh, potential diaspora investment. Um, so it's really is uh, the, the problem hasn't been really the linkage, creating the linkage or creating the platform. The problem has actually been how do we incentivize them and how do we create the security for them for investment and how do we make sure that uh, their investment is, uh, is, is done correctly. So in terms of incentivizing, you know, first thing that we need to understand is not all diaspora are created equal. Every diaspora is really different and it requires a, an individualized incentive program um, to bring them. If you are looking at for well experienced diaspora that have already retired in the Western, the, their incentive to move back is quite different from a lot younger people who, who wants to actually come in to make a big profit. So if we understand that, I think it will be a lot easier to incentivize it. And then the main thing is from my experience is how do they make sure that uh, their investment is not in a vein when they come to, to investing in Africa? Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so just moving right along then, um, could we discuss some of the existing tools, strategies, and case studies uh, meeting diaspora demand for investing? So you all have kind of already highlighted some of the research and the projects that you do, so let's deep dive into them a little bit more. So I'd like um, Halimatu and Stella to kind of highlight a bit uh, some of the projects and case studies that you two have been working on or what you've seen. Uh, I'll let Halimatu go first. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, for the case of Mali, uh, we, we are working on several uh, instruments to, to facilitate diaspora investment. Uh, the first one is that we are doing a uh, strong lobbying uh, towards Malian authorities as well as uh, cooperation agencies to, to have some facilities. Uh, so the, the first result is uh, launching of a one-stop shop for diaspora in Mali through the agency in charge of investment promotion. So the, the idea is to have an interlocutor dedicated for diaspora to reply to all the questions because uh, it is one of the difficulty. And the second one is to have the digitization of some processes to create a company, for instance, as well as to follow up um, uh, activities related to investment. So this was launched uh, months ago. So we don't have the visibility of the result, but this is uh, a, good, uh, a good beginning and uh, and a good way to, to reply to some of the preoccupation. Uh, within the association, we are, are also developing our own mechanism. So we launched in November, in last November, our five-year program, which is entitled SEGISO um, 2028. So it's a five-year program um, uh, dedicated for diaspora with four uh, axes to, to try to, to provide some answers. So the first one is to create a business zone for diaspora but uh, that will be also accessible to all investors and local entrepreneurs. So the idea is to, to have um, a business zone with all the facilities uh, and business incubator for diaspora with service providers, facilities, and uh, everything that is necessary to develop a business uh, when, you, when, you, when you want to develop something in Mali. So this is the first one. The sec one, second one is um, share agricultural zone because we've noticed that 70% of diaspora wants to invest in agriculture, so the idea was to develop a pilot to, to support this, uh, this trend. So there is two, two dimensions in this activity. The first one is training, because many people um, uh, are not uh, familiar with the agricultural sector, so the idea is to train them to better understand and to be able to manage a project in this, um, in this sector as well as to, to train um, uh, uh, people so that uh, youths in Mali uh, have the ability to work with diaspora because there is a lack of qualified human resources. So the idea is really to provide these human resources so that um, uh, there will be a greater success in this project. Uh, the second part is to, to have to offer a secure uh, land because this is a crucial uh, difficulty in Mali. And so the idea is to have a, um, a cooperative uh, so that diaspora can invest and work on, uh, on their project uh, for a certain time uh, with some facilities. So, so the idea is to, to have a secure land to, 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 um, to um, facilitate uh, uh, relationship with buyers, with providers, uh, training, to have advices so that they can invest securely and, uh, and after that try to scale up or buy their own land to develop a bigger project with greater impact. So this Thanks. is really the two phases of this. And the two, two last uh, part of this project is um, working on mobilization uh, on diaspora skills to train uh, local um, uh, workers in health uh, sector. And the last one is to, to propose a digital tool to track and orient invest investors because many members of diaspora want to invest but they don't have concrete projects in which invest to so the idea is to, to match uh, demand and offer so that they have more visibility. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's beautiful. It seems like you're creating an ecosystem that really like supports them from the beginning throughout their process. Uh, Stella? Thanks, Malai. Uh, so in 2012, Afford developed the concept of Remit Aid, which was very much about leveraging diaspora remittances for sustainable development. Now, this requires a lot of creativity. This is not about changing the behavior of people in terms of remittances, but this is about changing 10% of that behavior uh, in relation to the fact that a lot of the time, the diaspora are also responding to calls that they get in the middle of the night saying, I need money for education, etc., or I want to start a business, and they send that money and then they get frustrated because that money isn't used in the way that they expect it to be used, because in a year's time they get the same call again. So it's about also understanding that there is a small percentage of that, of that behavior that can also be changed, but then also looking within the remit aid, it was looking at things like diaspora bonds, mutual funds, 
co-financing, how can you bring together ODA, for example, together with diaspora finance, so then you can talk about savings. How do you bring that, all those instruments together in some sort of blended finance? So for us, a few things that we have tried, I think I mentioned earlier on about the co-financing, which we did with diaspora businesses uh, and supporting them to leverage and to um, uh, and to create, you know, the decent um, jobs on the ground. In addition, we have also done some work um, which is focused on diaspora bonds, uh, and we did develop, and, and this was very specific, looking at social impact bonds. So we were looking at a bond in Rwanda that was going towards affordable housing, and we're now taking that concept to Ghana and looking at affordable housing, uh, either for key workers or looking at affordable um, housing for student accommodation where the universities can be the takers. But these are quite important in understanding the drive for this for the diaspora is very much around the impact side and that's where we're hoping to bring them in. Other areas of work that we've also created are around developing crowd lending, a, a diaspora crowd, crowd lending model which um, it was a pilot, it was successful but it had its challenges. This was specifically in Ghana where um, the, the, the the regulatory, um, the framework, if you like, is not yet completed, and so it meant that the finance that the diaspora were providing through the crowd lending um, platform was a lot more expensive, but they were willing to take the risk. So again, going back to where the diaspora's um, uh, incentives and motivation are, it's very much around making that impact and therefore being willing to take that risk. And we continue in that work where we are actually providing some training also to diaspora investors to build their capacity in crowdfunding to be able to, su to support uh, you know, like businesses. And we are doing this work with ICMPD at the moment. Thank you so much, Stella. Um, so it, no, I really like what you're doing around the training. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think similar to Halema, there's like an ecosystem around it. And it seems like you're responding to different and specific needs, which responds to the diversity of motivations. Uh, so our final question for the panel um, at this moment is, where are the gaps and possible synergies and opportunities in diaspora investing, particularly since diaspora are already doing a lot of their own you know, mobilization and investing. And so I'd like Lee and Yusuf to respond to this because you both work at very interesting cross sections between public and private um, sectors and have, have seen the sector develop. And so what else is needed and what are the priorities? Uh, I'll let Lee go first. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> a lot of good answers going on here, so I think uh, a lot of good conversations are already coming up. But in the context of the Somali uh, diaspora investor, um, uh, a lot of the opportunity is around formalizing information. Um, for the high net worth, the family office, the, 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 the wealthy investor that kind of knows their sectors, they don't need a lot of help because they already know what they're doing. But it's the sideline sitters who have savings or have money that they, it's disposable or they, they, could, they want to invest it, they don't necessarily have good information. And Somalia is not known for, uh, well, the institutions are rebuilding. Uh, the financial services sector has made enormous strides but they're not yet diversified with products. And so a lot of what you're looking at is good information and awareness. In the survey we did years ago, um, when you asked uh, about awareness of co-investment opportunities, about 45% um, said, yes, I know about co-investment opportunities, but 55% said, I have no idea where I would find that. So that was one of the areas. The next big area that of need for all levels of investors is protections back home. It's to have a regulatory environment that protects foreign investment, that allows them to come back, that they're, they're, that they're assured they're going to be able to um, you know, protect it um, and make sure they can repatriate when they need to, uh, the, the, the earnings, that sort of a thing. Um, but I think that's kind of where I would go. Is that good? Yeah. All right. <laughs> you want me to keep it concise? So. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I think uh, Lee has said it uh, very well. Um, it's basically, when you look at uh, from what the diaspora want, it's really is the security and the guarantee and the, the smoothness. Because for many diaspora, uh, the, the money is hard earned. And usually it is their last saving. Some of them are actually even taking out their early retirement to invest in, in their uh, home, either buying a real estate or investing in uh, and um, startup business, but um, 
but there is also a risk on that that they cannot follow up and they cannot get the information. That is the biggest problem. And I think it, it is time the African government start to understand that diaspora are the biggest treasurer of our country. They are a national treasurer, and they, they need to start to treat, that, treat them as such to make sure that they're coming back and investing in their home country. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say that my speakers are wonderful. <laughs> Uh, we um, spoke yesterday about how to do this panel and it's going amazingly in my opinion so thank you all so much and part of the reason that we kept this part quite short was to allow you all the audience to get an opportunity to contribute to this conversation um, and so I just want to thank them again for keeping their uh, responses quite short so that you all will get a chance to answer um, to ask some of your questions so I'm now opening up the floor to our wonderful audience um, similar to how I have been strict with my panelists I will be strict with you as well so you have one minute to ask your question um, please you can introduce yourself tell us a little bit about what you do and then just jump right into your question or perhaps pre present a case that you want that the panelists to respond to but if you go over a minute I will cut you off <laughs> um, so I'm now opening up the floor for all of you hi Phil in the house I'm in corporate finance I do debt equity Mergers acquisition. Just a question to Lee. From your perspective in Somalia, um, I know Somalia is a Muslim. It's a Muslim nation, and they are Sharia-based investment. So, in terms of that, because um, there is a tendency for them to like Islamic banking is basically when somebody invests in a project, it's profit taking. So, uh, the investors. The, who are keen to invest in Somali, bearing in mind the religion lens that these uh, investors were in, were in Somalia. How are you able to guarantee an investment? Is it based on a profit model or is it a targeted return? Is there a hurdle rate? Um, just give us an insight on that. Thank you for that question. Lee will answer it after we take a few more. Over there in the blue. Hi, um, I'm Michelle. I look after migrant and diaspora banking uh, for Standard Bank in South Africa. So one of the challenges that we have, I'm actually from Zimbabwe, is having a conversation with somebody who is Zimbabwean and in the diaspora and a conversation around investing. And the first thing they say to you is, I don't think my money will be secure. So to contextualize that, last week what happened in Zimbabwe is everyone who had US dollar balances in their bank account, the central bank woke up and said they're converting it to local currency, which is worthless, essentially. So how do you have the conversations with diaspora when some of the countries that they want to invest in or come from are actually really volatile from a currency perspective? Um, so the, the desire is there. But how do you manage those complexities uh, to support them to manage those risks? Thank you so much. Um, right here in the front, Maroon shirt. Uh, hi, I'm Rukayat Kalawali, so founder of Pace Up Invest in Germany, France, and Nigeria. So it's a wealth tech company. So basically what we do is we help African diasporans to create global diversified portfolios, so investing in developed and also in developing countries. So my question is for Stella. You did mention about um, when it comes to co-investing, basically. So do you take like equity stake in that? Because one of the things that we look at is asset ownership as well when it comes to investing into these companies. And um, when it comes to the diaspora bonds, what is the duration? Because you focus a lot on the fact that we're maximizing social impact and it's all about patient investing. So what is the duration and also at what interest rates do the diasporans actually receive? Thank you so much. One more question. I saw the gentleman in the black suit. Uh, you. Thank you. Andrew Bamuje from Uganda. I'm the executive secretary for the Uganda Diaspora and Agribusiness Network. Two questions. Riding on the question from Standard Bank and the Zimbabwe experience, how do you get diasporans who have lost quite a bit of money over the long term to buy into investment vehicles, which in my view as a financier, I work for a development bank, um, to trust an investment vehicle and front load their money on the back of these hard experiences? And secondly, how do you build 
um, the trust? What instruments, what mechanics have you used to build trust yeah, in these vehicles to take off eventually? Thank you. Thank you. My audience is just as amazing as the panelists. You all did it under one minute. Um, okay, so I'll let Lee take the question on um, halal investing. Um, I'll let Stella, the one that was um, addressed to you on uh, interest rates. Um, Yusuf, I think you can take the one on securities. And then um, Halima, you can take the one on um, the, the final one that was just asked. So you, uh, Lee, I'll let you go first. She keeps us on the track. I, I, I've known since yesterday that I had to keep this really tight. Um, so your question on Islamic finance, um, th th it, you don't operate on the, on the um, profit incentive kind of thing, but there is a, a markup. So yes, you can project what it's going to be. Uh, you have either, like if you do asset-backed lending, like a, like a, a Murabaha, you buy a piece of equipment, say, for, for $10,000, and you say, I'm going to buy that equipment, I own it, you're going to be paying on it up to, it's going to cost you 11000 So you declare in the beginning what the markup is. It's more a matter of disclosure and agreement than it is a percentage. And you don't typically do it in percentages that doesn't, doesn't reconcile to it's not it's not uh, it's not uh, uh, Islamic um, a joint venture like a Musharaka a joint venture works on the joint venture principles and so yeah you there are Islamic vehicles that work essentially the same and in fact in many cases the earnings are greater uh, than in conventional Western finance I would say so I I don't that's not a deterrent in my opinion at all it's more a matter of understanding and in, and for Africa with the demographics and the way it's changing get ready because you're going to be way more deluged with Islamic finance in the not too distant future than you are in, in, in conventional uh, Western finance and then I, wa I want to pitch in on the Uganda question later it, but, but not now oh, okay um, so on, on the trust thing I don't want to take the thunder away from you um, in uh, some, of the, some, of, some of what we looked at in the Somali context was exactly the same because everything collapsed. So people lost enormous amounts of money in the banking systems, you know, everything tied to government or the banks. And so how do you bring back trust? Um, well, we looked at rating what was the most important thing, uh, what would they value most in terms of an investment assurance um, between a uh, matching grant or a guarantee, a guarantee ranked higher than a matching grant. So what they're saying is I want some kind of an international, a, a guarantee from an international organization that was reputable. So not, we also said, would you take a guarantee from a Somali bank, a local bank? We want to see if they respond to that. And it was a lower rating because it was a Somali bank. But you're talking about some kind of international guarantee. So donors can play a huge, huge role in de-risking just by putting up guarantees. We actually piloted a guarantee with CETA. I, we did, uh, wrote a, a, a credit guarantee scheme, the first one in Somalia which in Islamic finance is not, it's not necessarily the common uh, guarantee approach. It's more of an insurance uh, mechanism. You can't make money on the guarantee itself. So there are issues with how you structure a guarantee. But we ended up getting an operational fatwa out of an Islamic cleric in, um, a finance cleric or expert in Kuwait. And we used that to help convince the Sharia boards in the banks in Somalia to participate. And the ones that did really enjoyed it. And now it's gone through one iteration. It was a very simple teach the, the climate how to work with it, and they're going to the next generation. So that's the next evolution in Somali finance. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, Yusuf, do you want to answer the one around securities? Uh, yes. Um, again, uh, once we understand how we're going to attract the diaspora, and we, we will understand their concern in terms of the security, um, losing their money, and what have you. Um, so. We, we, we need to understand because other investor, foreign investors from uh, America or other countries, they do have uh, a risk mitigation plan uh, or insurance, for example, uh, against a political uh, revolution or if something happens, their government is protecting them. Uh, so the diaspora, unfortunately, they are on their own. So if they make a $100,000 investment or buying a real estate or buying something, if something happened, they really don't have a good mechanism of doing it. So the government needs to understand this and they need to have a special way of looking at things. If there is any litigation, they need to make it fast. For, I can give an example in Ethiopia. About 20 <coughs> years ago, a lot of diaspora invested in a real estate business and that business went uh, 
bankrupt and still nothing has happened and is still in the court and it cannot be treated uh, in the long term in the court uh, system so even if there is any claim that it has to be handled right away and the other, the other major major problem for the diaspora also I really want to mention is how do they guarantee their money against the devaluation that especially we're looking at in the many African countries right now because their money uh, they require to convert it to the local currency but the devaluation is killing it. So all of those questions really is, I think, uh, is a government's answer, in my opinion. Thank you. Government people, are you here to answer? <laughs> uh, Stella, go ahead. Thank you, Malai. Um, so I'll respond to, I'm going to do a bit of a mishmash of some of the questions here, but um, I think the first thing around the trust issue, just to mention that the external environment is challenging, and I don't think we can get away from that. It definitely is challenging. But there are some pilots and small examples that have been successful. And I think sometimes it's about looking at those small examples and small scale initiatives that the diaspora have led on that can be scaled up. Because often those things, it really is about trying to take that to the next level. Um, in, terms of the, um, in terms of our programs, one of the things that we did was really also understanding that when the diaspora invest or when they put their money into projects, they want to be part of it. So when I spoke about the, the program where we were able to secure like 50% instead of 20%, we were actually focusing on diaspora entrepreneurs themselves who were putting in part of their own money into their own business. So that is one example. Another way of doing it is also where the diaspora, even if, they're not, even if it's not their own business, they have a role to play either as a mentor or something or other because that also makes them feel like they're closer to the... Um, initiative and that they can also take a part of it, they can see everything that is going on and that's also a good way to do that. Um, in terms of the co-investing, whether we took equity, um, no, so the first program was actually focused mainly on grants. Um, what we're doing now is looking to take that into, into loans and we're also looking at guarantee loan schemes as well. Um, the diaspora bonds, um, the, the idea was to have them for sort of three to five years or thereabouts. And I think the percentage, I cannot remember this, um, I'll give you the correct answer later, but I think it was around 5%, but I can't really remember. However, just to take that a little bit further, what we're looking at now are very uh, um, project-specific bonds. And actually, and that's not to send people away from this room, but I know that this afternoon in the other room, on the Gambia, there will be some discussions around this because they are looking to take this forward, which is going to be a project-specific bond. So there will be some examples there on that side. Um, just to go back also to the question which was linked to the Zimbabwe example. Um, we actually supported a business some years back um, that was looking at logistics and transport within a specific region and providing this to farmers in terms of how they got their goods to market and so forth and so on. Uh, Inalene has actually got a platform from the UK um, where, where um, you know, where, uh, what do you call it, people are actually able to invest. It's not a lot of money, it's like £600 a year that people are investing into the business and that business is going into farmers um, and that, um, that has been very, very successful because I think she started it almost 10 years ago and to date maybe three people have asked for their returns but otherwise they keep reinvesting and it keeps going into this business that is being, that is basically, is carrying on on the ground in Zimbabwe. And I can share a little bit more information on that later as well. Later, yeah. Thank you, Stella. Uh, Halima, can you um, respond to the question on trust? Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. So trust is a, is a crucial aspect in investment, so this is why we are working on several dimensions to try to build this, this uh, trust. The first one is communication. Uh, first, they have to be aware of the risk uh, and so, so that they, they are able to mitigate those risks. So we are communication on success stories as well as failure, so they are, they are well aware of the difficulty of the sector and they have the possibility to exchange with people that already uh, uh, path through this way to, to get benefit from that. The second one is to mobilize a pool of experts uh, um, they can rely on to, to mitigate those risks because it is also a difficulty. Um, for instance, in Mali, 70% um, of uh, court cases are related to land dispute. So, uh, because people didn't rely on expert notaries to secure the transaction. So the idea is really um, 
um, to, to mobilize experts uh, in different aspects related to business, business plan, fiscality, legal, export, logistic, all these aspects that may secure this transaction and investment. Uh, the third one is really to go step by step because uh, when you don't know a country or you are getting into a new project, uh, you have to be cautious. So we really try to make them going step by step to make sure that they will um, mitigate those risks. And the last one is to work on preparation because we've noticed that many people um, from diaspora are coming with uh, some ideas or they have a perception of the country. Uh, and so we, we are really um, uh, giving many advices uh, so that they can prepare and mitigate those risks. So I will be, try to be short. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, so uh, could I get a time check, Maro? Like, to a coffee break? We're, okay. Thank you. So um, we're going to close the uh, plenary now. And so I would love um, our panel to give some of their final statements. Um, so what are your top two takeaways, maybe one takeaway, um, if our audience remembers nothing else from this conversation or even nothing else from this conference, what's the one thing they should take away? And then could you also give our audience some homework? So maybe one assignment or top priority task that they could do tonight or maybe when they return to the office to move forward the field of diaspora investment. So I'm just going to go right down the row, starting with Halima too, and then ending with Stella. So go right ahead. Thank you. So I will try to be quick. Um, the first one, I think that we really need to co-build those strategies uh, if we really want to take into consideration difficulties and need of diaspora. So it is very important to have this approach. Uh, the second one is to, to really try to, to build secure vehicles uh, to mitigate those risks and uh, uh, providing the guarantees and security so that invest in diaspora can invest more easily. Um, so we, we talk about trust, I will not come back about this issue, but this is very important. And we, we really need to, to take into consideration specificities of diaspora, uh, the fact that uh, sometimes they, they, they don't all live on the site, so many of them are abroad, so we really need to, to think about these dimensions to, to digitize process, processes, to work on procedures that allow them to follow up some project even if they are, they are not on the countries and have uh, the security, for instance, for creation of companies. Uh, tax procedures, um, everything. And the fourth aspect is really to, to work on uh, human resources, to have qualified human resources. Particularly if you don't live in the country, you need to rely on human resources that can support you in developing your business uh, to be hired. And for me, these are the four main uh, aspects that need to be taken into consideration. Thank you. You have homework for that? Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, co so, yeah. Co build the strategies and think about this kind of vehicle to, to have greater impact. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. A few key takeaways, I guess. Um, in, in the case of the Somali diaspora, I'd say this: uh, Somali diasporans understand that the narrative is much deeper than what's popular and in the news. And what everybody thinks about when you think of Somalia is all the, uh, which is real, the violence and the threat. But that's not all that's going on by a long shot. And so um, it's true institutions are rebuilding. It's true protections are still being rebuilt. It's true that there's a lot of need for continued support and development in Somalia. That's why a lot of us are there as donors um, helping. But business investment is happening. It's been happening. The private sector has been resilient all along. It's been the backbone of the Somali um, uh, you know, success story. We look about what it's come through and where it's now going to. So I would say. Um, uh, if I, it's hard to boil it down. There's so many different aspects to go into, and everyone's giving great, great uh, explanations. Uh, for the, the diaspora investor who knows the context, um, they need assurances and protections. They need the regulatory environment, they need the protections. The court systems there, actually, there's tiered courts, because you can go to court in a, a clan-based system, or in a Sharia system, or in the legal system. And so there actually are ways, and we actually, in the fund I ran, foreclosed on a, on a loan, and actually went to court and were successful, because we had properly registered the loan, all that kind of stuff. So that works. So I th I'd say uh, access to information, good disclosures, transparency, all the different uh, reasons why you can trust an investment. And investors, diaspora investors, understand and you have to take risk to get reward. So you can't remove all risk. De-risking doesn't mean you've made it a risk-free. It means you've helped mitigate some of that to induce them in. In terms of homework, 
I would have you Google on Al Jazeera Mogadishu construction boom and watch the video. That'll tell you something. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was recent in the last like three months. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, I think uh, Lee said it all, and uh, I don't need to add anyone more. Oh, okay. Thank oh, you. Okay. Any, any um, I guess uh, to stress enough, uh, what is the government is going to do to incentivize the, for diaspora to come back home, and I, it needs to have a, a serious look at. Uh, I don't need to narrate the, the advantage of them that they actually had to do something. I've uh, been involved in this uh, diaspora thing since 1998, and believe me, 25 years later, we're still talking about how do we attract the diaspora to come back home. <laughs> and, you know, this, this something has to be done now. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Uh So, four key things. I think the first thing is, when you think about when you think about remittances and investment, think about an arch. The first arch is remittances where people are giving one on one, a hundred billion dollars. And then think about the other end of the arch, which is investment, and that is very much about how you formalize and how you develop structures, right? So it's the added value. So you've got the remittances, you've got the investment elements of it. And I think that's really important to understand. It's about developing the formal structures. This sector that we work in for us is really a sector. It's, about, it's, about, it's a diaspora sector, um, essentially. Now, how do we sustain this? And of course, when we talk about investment, we're talking about how we sustain the contributions and the impacts of the diaspora. So we do need to think also about how we sustain all of the work that we're doing and how we sustain the impact. And this is where the sustainability and the development of the investment structures and the products and all of that are really key. There are four key things that we always talk about when we talk about how we take this work to the next level and the four things that we've also tried. And this is around one, developing the formal structures, two uh, is about scaling up, three is about incentivizing, and four is about institutionalizing. When you think about sustainability, you have to think about institutions. And we need to think about where we take this and how we institutionalize this work that we're doing to ensure that this makes an impact for the long term. Homework, if you want to help to sustain the sector, come and talk to me. <laughs> I love that. That's great homework. And I believe Afford has a um, booth in the marketplace, correct? All right. So, Perfect. So definitely find them there. Um, so I would like to um, thank you all for these great assignments. And I know our audience um, are diligent students who will do their homework promptly. I won't stand too much longer between you and your coffee break, but um, I just wanted to summarize some of the things that we talked about on this panel. We learned that there is um, th what's important for what the diaspora wants um, to invest in Africa's future is the diversity of products and interventions that meets their diversity their diverse needs and motivations. We need an ecosystem with infrastructure, support, and security that includes training, capacity building, human resources as mentioned, and all of that needs to come in a package with trust, communication, and information. Easy to do? We got this. <laughs> <laughs> and so my assignment to all of you is to please keep in touch. These conferences are great for starting the conversations, but as Yusuf said, we've been having these conversations for a while. Um, and so it is up to all of us in this room to take these discussions forward with partnerships, collaboration, and action. Otherwise, these ideas will never become a reality. Um, and so thank you all again for being here. Uh, I do want to say that DMA is at the um, a booth as well, so I'm also happy to continue conversing with all of you. Um, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank IFAD um, for having us all here and their partners and um, for bringing us all together for this conversation. And I would like to thank my amazing panelists who were timely um, for their insights and the amazing work that they're doing. And I would like to thank all of you, the amazing audience, for your time, your attention, and your presence. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> thank you. Please stay there for a photo opportunity for the thank you very much. In the meantime, so we close the first part of the morning. You are all allowed to go outside for the coffee break. The coffee break will last until eleven sharp. And at eleven we'll be back again here in this room for the next session on models and financial instruments for diaspora investment, addressing public and private investment opportunities. So please come back to this room at 11 o'clock. Thank you very much and enjoy the coffee break.
So ladies and gentlemen, please have your seat. We are about to start the second session of the day of the diaspora investment track. I see a lot of people are entering the room now, so I'm going to wait two more minutes. But please, have a seat. So ladies and gentlemen, again, welcome to the second session of the day. The session is on models and financial instruments for diaspora investment, addressing public and private investment opportunities. It will be one hour. It will go until noon, until 12 o'clock, and then you will have two hours for lunch and networking. We will resume in this room at two o'clock. So without further ado, I will just give the floor to Elizabeth Howard, the Chief Executive Officer and Founder of the African Crowdfunding Association, as a moderator of this panel. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. You can start. Thank you so much, Mauro. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and especially with such an esteemed panel. Thank you so much for making this possible to, to IFAD. Um, so, the panelists who have come before us have, have really, I think, informed a lot of people in this room around the challenges um, getting money from the global north to the global south. And on this panel, we're going to go a little bit more into detail around the plumbing, around the technicalities, um, so that um, people in the room understand what is required from a broader set of stakeholders um, to actually enable this, this, uh, this flow of capital. So. Um, we, we talk a lot about the potential, and we have been talking a lot about the potential for, for a decade or more, and the people on this panel um, sitting beside me have been part of that journey from the beginning. And um, to, it, it, we, we talk a lot about this potential, but we don't really understand, I think, um, just how difficult it is to create products um, for the diaspora to, to invest back back home, right? So um, to give you some idea, if, if you're sitting in the diaspora and you want to create a product to invest back home, you have to go and find the diaspora, organize it, segment it, map it, train them on the, the investment opportunities that are available and how they should be thinking about rifts, just like you would any other investor. And then you have to design a product, design something that actually meets their needs. And you are sitting in a country where the regulatory environment has not been designed um, with, with these investors in mind. And so you've got an extraordinary number of barriers facing whatever type of product you're going to build. And then once you've done that, um, you need to go look at the demand side, right? Look at who is going to be benefiting from these, these financial flows. If it's startups and SMEs, you're not going to sit with all of the same challenges as anyone who's trying to invest in a startup or SME. And, um, you know, we could speak for an hour about just how difficult that is, right? For anyone who's, who's even here on the ground. So, um, needless to say, the, uh, the people in the private sector that have dedicated the past decade to solving these challenges are, are very special people. Uh, they care very deeply about what they do. They care deeply about our continents. Um, they've often done years and years of work pro bono at their own expense, bootstrapping to get to where they are. And I really believe that um, it, it, it is unnecessarily hard <laughs> to do what they're doing. So let me allow all of our, our panelists here to just to to introduce themselves to you and make this a little bit more personal. Tell us why you care about diaspora investment and why you're doing what you do today. So, um, yeah, let's start with Alain. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and 
You know, my name is Alan Riquier, and then I'm, I'm a founder of an equity crowdfunding platform. So why do I do what I do? Is, you know, two issues came into my life when I started my journey as an entrepreneur. So I was based in Africa before, so I wanted to start a business. I couldn't get access to finance. So as you know, we live in a country, in Africa, it's a banking system. So if you are a startup, it's hard for you to get a seed capital to start your business. So then I decided to leave the continent and then went to study in Europe. So when, after my studies, then I started working in a private equity, in investment, and then I was also working for incubators. Then I came to, to, to Nigeria. It was back in 2017 to support an incubator and then some startups. And then I found two investment opportunities in those startups, but I noticed that I couldn't invest in those companies since I was based in the Netherlands. So then from that moment, I was like, so there are so many people like me in the diaspora who would like to invest, but they don't have the right financial product. So then from that moment, I decided to build a financial product for the diaspora, and then which is an equity crowdfunding platform. So we do two things. We connect, we, we, we look for startups with high potential, and then we find diaspora that we put into uh, what we call um, business angel networks, and then we connect them to those investment opportunities. So using an equity crowdfunding platform. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I feel like we're, 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 we're brothers and sisters in arms on <laughs> this journey. Um, right, Andrew from Kiva. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andrew Cabucho, working as an investment manager at Kiva. Uh, Kiva is a US-based, impact-focused uh, asset manager <clears throat> that was formed with a mission of creating financial access to underserved communities in emerging markets through the peer-to-peer -peer lending mechanism. So Kiva has been powered by our crowdfunding platform, uh, which is basically a publicly available website where we empower um, lenders in the global north with uh, opportunities to lend uh, to deserving entrepreneurs and micro-borrowers in the in emerging, con uh, com uh, emerging countries. So we are actively present in about 80 countries in Asia, Africa, and uh, Latin America, where we have, I would say, catalyzed lending of close to $2 billion since inception in 2005. Um, and as a company, we believe that, you know, much as, uh, you know, dreams can be universal, opportunities are not. And we purpose to create these opportunities for deserving uh, micro-entrepreneurs in the global south through link the, linking them up with lenders in, uh, in, in developed countries. So we are mostly present in the U.S. where we have a network of close to 2 million lenders. And of course, the diaspora community is very important to us because being present and active in 80 countries in emerging markets, um, they can always find opportunities to um, invest and not necessarily invest but also create social impact or social economic impact in the countries from which they originated. So we will engage more on, on, uh, on the model and some of the ways we can un further unlock capital to these uh, emerging opportunities. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, right, and then Mohammed from the Ethiopian Diaspora Agency, you've got a quite a unique um, role on this panel in, in the sense that um, Mohammed hasn't created a, a, a product um, or an instrument per se, but he's a critical person for those of us who are. So Mohammed, yeah, please tell us um, why you do what you do, why your role exists. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, actually, I mean, having a diaspora investment product and owning that product are very two different things. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a person, I'm Mohammed uh, from Ethiopia, the Director General for Ethiopian Diaspora Agency, uh, now currently it's the Ethiopian Diaspora Service. It's an institution that is fully dedicated to organize and to mobilize the Ethiopian diaspora and to bridge the Ethiopian diaspora with their home country and also to facilitate their demands in terms of uh, business trade and industry, whatever. Uh, their engagements at home. So actually I'm here to take notes uh, in between hundreds of uh, public uh, sectors that are very focused and resourceful in diaspora engagements. So 
as a government institution, uh, we are the first contact person for our diasporas, whether they are coming in uh, organized or private. Uh, and also, we are the institution to facilitate their uh, investment projects, both uh, in cities and also in regional governments. And also, at the embassy level, uh, we are the, uh, the, I mean, the responsible institution to communicate, to disseminate information regarding the investment packages and potentials at home, and also the, necess the necessary platforms uh, available. Thank you. Thanks, Mohammed. Uh, and lastly, we've got Johannes. Um, from DT Global, and I know that if I were to say you are the Director for Market Systems at DT Global, that does not translate at all the work that you really do. Um, uh, yeah, Johannes, tell us a little bit about um, your passion projects, why you're in this space, um, yeah, how you got here. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, uh, first and foremost, I am a member of the diaspora. I left uh, Ethiopia when I was 16, some 36 years ago. I'm dating myself. A uh, very difficult time. Like many in the diaspora, we leave home for various reasons. Mine happened to be war, civil war, and persecution. Um, and I, my family and I ended up in the United States. We found refuge. Um, and so I'm very proud to say I'm an Ethiopian American. Uh, beyond that, professionally, I'm a securities lawyer. I practiced law in, in the United States, mostly in New York, for about 10 years. Six of them uh, spent on Wall Street, working for a firm called, uh, um, uh, the firm that practiced mostly in the financial sector. Um, I worked as a bond lawyer. Um, and, and worked with uh, institutions of both sovereign as well as financial institutions and financing um, uh, various products. Uh, for the past 15 years, I've been in the international development space, uh, working for various institutions, uh, but continue to do uh, both my diaspora-related work as well as development work. Uh, I am uh, the founder of the Ethiopian Diaspora Business Forum. I am on the advisory board of the African Diaspora Network. And I am a trustee of the Ethiopian Diaspora Trust Fund, uh, which was inspired by the Ethiopian Prime Minister uh, to collect funds to support uh, social developments in Ethiopia, raised $7 million from 25,000 small, uh, 25, small donors from 90 different countries. All of these are Ethiopian Diaspora. In my day-to-day -day job, uh, Elizabeth, you're right, as a market systems director, but it also includes working with the diaspora. For example, one of the projects we're working on is with the Lebanese diaspora in Lebanon. As you know, Lebanon is going through very difficult times to help mobilize uh, diaspora investments. Eric Gouchard, who spoke yesterday, is uh, one of our experts working with us in promoting uh, investments and uh, development with the uh, Lebanese diaspora, and many more. Um, I'll speak later to the very specific work we do uh, related to diaspora investment later. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to do a, a round of, of questions to our panelists in which they're going to explain what exactly their, their product is, right? So how are they allowing individuals in the diaspora to invest back home? And um, I, I want all of our panelists to, to clearly distinguish between donations from the diaspora and investments from the diaspora. Sometimes, because of the regulations, people who are trying to facilitate these flows find themselves in a space where those two things overlap. Because investments are regulated and donations are not. So that's a, a key thing for everyone in the audience to understand. Another key thing to understand is when, we, when we're talking about the diaspora, very often, we've, we've spoken a lot about segmenting and mapping and, 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 and who, is, who is investing in what. But in general, you're dealing with individuals, ordinary people, and as soon as you are Going to individual investors, um, from a regulatory perspective, you're talking about retail investors. And anyone offering a product to retail investors um, will find themselves in a regulated space. 
So these are important concepts to, to understand as we go through this conversation. You'll be hearing about crowdfunding, you'll be hearing about equity crowdfunding, debt crowdfunding, other forms of crowdfunding, and you'll be hearing words like investment funds and trust funds and syndicates. All of these things are, have one thing in common. They are trying to pull small, relatively small amounts from a large group of individual investors, okay? That's what we're all trying to do. Um, right, so, so with, those, with those concepts in mind, I'm, I'm going to start with, if I may, Alain, um, in, in the equity crowdfunding space. Can you tell us, Alain, who are you targeting um, in, in, in the diaspora? How much are they investing? What are they investing in? And how does your solution enable that? And you can refer to your journey with regulations in, in the European Union. Thanks. No, thank you, Elizabeth. So for us, you know, we are an equity crowdfunding platform, so we do only equity. So then this business is regulated in the Netherlands. And then to, to be into, into this equity space, you need to have a license. So for us, we then chose, because to get a license, it's, it costs a lot of money. It's around 100,000 euros. But there are other investment vehicles that we use. So for instance, for us, we are, we are using what we call a special purpose vehicle. So this is, this is um, a kind of financial you know, infrastructure where you pull peop um, a small amount of money from people, you put it in one uh, big company, and then this company then can come to Ghana and then buy shares in that company in Ghana. So that's how we pull money from the diaspora. So this is regulated by, by the Chamber of Commerce. We don't need to go to, 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 to the financial authority. So we set up this kind of facility. And then, what we, and then anyone from 100 euros can put money in it, in, in, in this SPV. And then for, we have this SPV then that, that, that buys shares in every company we invest in in Africa. And then we invest in what? So we invest in startups. We, we invest in companies that are raising seed capital, and then we only invest in tech companies. So we don't do SMEs. We don't do companies without, you know, growth opportunities. Because for us, our mission is to build startups on the continent and then to create jobs. So, and we know, for instance, that the banking system is there to, for SMEs, company with, you know, that are growing, but there are no funding for companies that are starting. So for us, we focus on the, on the startup phase, and then we use what we call a venture capital mode. So we're looking for really early stage companies with high growth. We invest in many companies. We, our aim is to, to invest every year in 100 startups, but only to have one success in the long run. So we can, because in, in, in the venture capital world, it's about the quantity but having one good investment. So that's how we look at it. And then our mission is to give back wealth to the diaspora as investors. Thank you. Quick question. Um, if I am in the US, can I come onto your platform and make an investment? First of all, we have many issues. Before you become even a, U, a U.S. citizen coming to invest on my platform, my bank will, will, will also ask me, so who are first your investors on your platform? Because we only have to have Europeans first, and then Americans, because of the regulation in the U.S. and then all those contracts between U.S. and Europe, American investors are not allowed to, I mean, from the, from the banking system in Europe, are not allowed to use European platform. So, no. So let's just sit on that. This, this whole conference has been saying that the US is the biggest market for diaspora investment in Africa. And US-based uh, people are not allowed to use a platform like Alliance. Right, so I, I find this co completely crazy. Um, it's, it's very unfortunate, but that's an example of the type of barriers that we have today trying to channel funds in. Um, thanks so much. We're going to go in, into more details about those challenges in the next round. Um, let's move on to Andrew from Kiva. Um, this is a particularly unique model where we're, again, in the US, very, very complex um, regulatory framework. And um, we are trying to channel funds from Americans to Africa, okay, to African projects on the ground. And, um, you know, Kiva's essentially 
when it addresses itself to Americans, it, it's not offering them an investment product per se, so they are unregulated. But then on the, the African side, they are um, effectively lending to uh, via microfinance institutions, okay? So I, I hope I described that correctly. And again, you can see what is required to, to, to find a solution within these, these regulatory frameworks that are so complex. Um, Andrew, please tell us a little bit more about that model. Thanks. Sure, thank you. <clears throat> so, I mean, um, so the best way to think about Kiva is basically um, the midway or midpoint between outright philanthropy and commercial investment. So basically, uh, we provide users on the platform with opportunities to lend. So the, the individuals mostly in the U.S. are able to get on the platform and lend to opportunities that are presented on the platform by our financial intermediary partners in, uh, in emerging markets. And uh, basically what Kiva has done is to democratize philanthropy. So you can lend as low as $25 <clears throat> or in multiples of $25 to these opportunities that are presented. So, of course, to address the issue or the fact that this is actually a loan and the money has to come back, we chose to work with microfinance partners in emerging economies uh, because basically credit is is their core business. Um, and uh, Kiva is registered uh, as a nonprofit in the US, so basically we are not necessarily presenting investment opportunities. I mean, in the first session, they mentioned that, you know, one of the key drivers of, you know, diaspora investments is actually impact. So I would say Kiva, whatever, what we are selling to the individuals or the users on the platform is basically an opportunity to contribute to social economic impact. And on the platform, they are able to lend or contribute to development based on their, I would say, different impact preferences. So we have opportunities to lend to, you know, climate change, women, rural economies, agriculture, just based on their impact preference. Um, and of course, in the US, they are able to get, I would say, I would say, like tax incentives for making some of these donations for both our individuals and, and, uh, and corporate partners. Um, However, we, we have in the past and are still looking for ways to provide return-seeking uh, investment opportunities to our users on the platform. But of course, the biggest um, barrier really is regulation because we now have to become subject to securities uh, regulations in the U.S and probably the institution as, as it's currently registered might need to take a different form uh, and also be capitalized differently if we are to offer investment products to the general public. And of course, we are working with microfinance entities in emerging markets, so I would say a bulk of them are actually regulated entities, and local regulations have not yet I mean, crowdfunding is not a common or mainstream way in which financial intermediaries raise funds. So we have found it uh, taking a long time or most of our transaction having to undergo like some extra level of scrutiny from uh, central banks in, in emerging markets before we can actually set up or onboard our microfinance uh, partners. So I would say those, those are the key differences between you know, what Kiva offers and what an investment uh, product would, would look like, basically. Thank you so much. Um, here's another important thing for the audience to keep in mind when, they, when you're listening to this. Um, Ella mentioned that um, an individual can put 100 euros through his platform. On Kiva, you can put $25. Imagine the compliance cost of what they've had to do proportional to that tiny, tiny ticket. It's completely disproportional. It's not surprising that Kiva is a, is a non-profit. Um, this is the, the central challenge of, of investing. 
the cost of compliance is, is really, really high, but the needs on, on the African side of the SMEs and startups are, are relatively small, okay, in, in comparison. That's what makes these investment instruments and models so challenging to get off the ground, and that's why um, such a broad range of stakeholders um, and, and, and de-risking institutions and, and donors and anyone that can reduce the cost of compliance on their behalf is so important. Um, quick question uh, to you, David. Oh, Andrew, <laughs> sorry. Um, do your people who invest through Kiva call themselves investors or donors or philanthropists? I would say we call them social lenders, <clears throat> uh, mainly because, um, yes, they, they are making a donation which is in the form of a returnable grant. So this money has, they, there's the expectation that the money has to come back to them. But they have also offered like a credit risk guarantee. So in the event the end borrower, who is the micro entrepreneur, who's a client of the microfinance, is not able to pay, then that loan can also be written off on the lender side. So basically, um, what we enable some of these micro insurance and financial intermediaries to do is to serve communities that they would otherwise not serve without the presence of this credit risk uh, guarantee. So I would say in future models, we might you know, think about compensating these individuals for providing this guarantee over and above, say, providing, say, a return um, for, for the investment. Very interesting. Um, Johannes, um, I'm going to go to you. Tell us, um, and I know you work in, in so many different ways. He said he was a securities lawyer, and that's the type of training that you need to get into this space. Um, tell us how you pool monies from your diaspora investors. Um, we've, we've, I know there's a lot of jargon, like special purpose vehicle and trust fund, whatever. Um, but again, keep in mind, all it is is pooling money into something formal, okay, that's then going to invest in Africa. Uh, Johannes, tell us um, with as, as little jargon as possible how you do that. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, diaspora investments happen whether they're laws or not, regulated or unregulated. They usually take place. Um, Second, the challenge we face, and I've been in this space for 20 years, uh, including with you know, my day job working as a lawyer, as a securities lawyer, um, is really how do we move from the small time people make, finding their own ways to pulling together money and investing to, to a more structured, institutionalized, as we said earlier and yesterday, uh, more ordinary, uh, way of investing. If you want to scale up and pool funds and start investing at a larger scale, you have to comply with the laws and regulations of the country of origin and the destination of the investment. This is critical. When you scale up, when the amount of money gets more complex and complicated and the investment types are complicated, then you, you are visible on the radar to the regulators um, and you have to remember, don't really hate the securities laws. They're created to protect the investors. They're consumer protection laws. In the US, they came about after the uh, 1920s crash of the stock market, uh, where many people lost their savings, life savings. Uh, the economy was devastated. So you have the 33 and the 34 Act, the Securities Exchange Act and the Securities Act that protected primarily small investors. Um, and the way it's set up, as Eric yesterday talked about it, to, to pull together investments, you have to be registered or you have to be exempted. If, to be a registered security, it's a very expensive co compliance process. Right? It's prohibitive for many, uh, including bonds, by the way. They are registered securities. I have experience working and advising African governments um, even those who got in trouble are getting out of trouble. And so the, the alternative is there's an there's exception. The exception is you have to be an accredited investor. 
An accredited investor is you have to have a net worth of a million dollars minus your primary residence. This is US securities laws. Uh, every Western developed country has their own securities laws. Some African countries also do have securities laws at different very uh, complexity level. Uh, pooled investments, uh, small family friends pool investments are allowed uh, under a different exception. But more recently, in the last 10 years, the, uh, I think it was 2012, there was a Jobs Act that tried to simplify the, regu the regulatory burden on investors in the US. And a more recent update uh, that simplified again allowed the small pooled investment uh, uh, mechanisms. When I say small pool investments, these are people who don't know each other. You're aggregating investments into one pool for, for onward investment into your destination. Um, so these varying uh, aspects exist, but it's possible. For example, I worked on a specific opportunity where 350 Ethiopian American doctors pooled their resources um, and they raised $10 million. They're in the process of building a $100 million hospital in Ethiopia. Um, but the compliance cost, when you're building a $100 million hospital, it's okay to spend the money required for compliance. And sometimes uh, we think the investment may, not, may be frivolous. If people don't want to spend money on professional services, on accountants, on lawyers. And, and that's part of the educational challenge uh, we face. But it was done, and it, we were able to do that. Uh, the same thing with uh, bond investment. Uh, a similar, you know, you're, you're raising $100 million <laughs> funds and, and, a, and a bond issuance. You should properly comply with the laws uh, to be able to, to raise that kind of uh, investment. So it's, it's possible. It's done. But then at a the smaller level, there are mechanisms, other mechanisms we use, for example, uh, bunching together angel investors into an SPV vehicle, um, but it has to be managed with a professional fund manager with the capacity and knowledge. Uh, sometimes everybody wants to be a fund manager, everybody wants to be an investor. It's not possible. Somebody who can't balance their checkbook should not be managing an investment fund. Right? That's why there are laws. Right? That we don't want your hard earned, every diaspora I know works hard, whether cleaning toilets or driving taxi or being a banker, it doesn't matter. People work very hard for those earned cash and their money should be protected in the way they invest them. Because there are a lot of frauds. I've, in my own work in the last 20 years, I've seen a lot of diaspora who've been swindled in their home country, whether it's in Kenya, in Nigeria, in Zimbabwe, in Ethiopia, and these laws exist to protect those investors. So let's not look at them as a hurdle, but let's find, as a lawyer, I'm paid to find a way. And I tell you, I've never failed on a, on, on a challenge that we were given as, as an institution to find a workaround. There's always a workaround, uh, uh, you know, with the proper professional services to, to find a mechanism uh, to invest. I don't want to continue. It's more, but I'll come back later. Thanks so much, Johannes. And I really take my hat off to you for, for what you've had to navigate to do what you do. Um, all right, Mohammed, I am curious. If um, Alain or, or myself or, or, or somebody wants to influence the home regulatory environment in Ethiopia by talking to local regulatory authorities, the central bank and maybe others, in order to create a safe and secure pathway for people abroad to invest through entities that are registered and incorporated in Ethiopia, how would your office help me? Yeah, thank you. I think before coming to the specific question, I think the, I mean, for countries, uh, 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 we need to know that, you know, where that country is positioned in terms of the, the, the overall the ecosystem, the business environment. Uh, for when it comes to the diaspora investment, except the prefix that we add diaspora, it's, it's all about investments. It's all about investment. So 
the world is comprising of different countries with their own unique behavior, with their own unique characteristics in terms of the business environment, in terms of the regulatory frameworks. So as we always say that we need to map the diaspora, we also need to map the countries depending on their status of, I mean, the favorability of, uh, for, for business and also the regulatory frameworks. You know, uh, and also we need to have that, the success factors depending on the specific natures of the countries, okay? Uh, we, we have developed and developing countries, we have the liberal and the illiberal, illiberal countries, we have the open and the, maybe the closed or a command economy system. So where, in, in which specific condition and country uh, specific condition is the diaspora investment become more successful? That is, so uh, as a country first, we, need to, we are working to locate ourselves where we are to attract the diaspora investment. So uh, it's co to provide so that context-specific diaspora investment package. And the, coming to the specific uh, question first, uh, in Ethiopia, for instance, we do have more than 4,200 diaspora investment projects. Uh, in fact, all of them may not be pro uh, operational now. Some of them uh, operational, some of them uh, in the pre-implementation process. Uh, maybe 51% in the real estate sector. We do have uh, 471 hotels owned by diaspora investors. And maybe when it comes to job creation, the diaspora investment area is the second next to government in terms of creating jobs, in terms of employment. And also in terms of capital, it's it, it took 10% of the foreign direct investment in Ethiopia. So we, already, we, are, we are already working in engaging and in attracting diaspora investment. So what we, got, what we, what we do is basically, first, we identify the diaspora investment potentials in Ethiopia, sector-specific, region-specific potentials. Now, second, we provide the exhaustive list of the regulatory frameworks depending on each investment types. Let me say, for example, just before three years, there were 32 investment types that were not allowed for diaspora investors. Okay, just five years before the diaspora were not allowed to engage in the finance sector. Fintechs were not thinkable. So we, we, we prepared the exhaustive list of the investment arena, okay, the, the regulatory frameworks, and also the custom system. Just practical example. We have uh, a multi-millionaire millionaire dollar investment project recently launched by uh, the name Red Fox. Uh, they have a data center in, uh, in the Silicon Valley. Now they are opening their own data center in Addis, in Ethiopia. So uh, once they, are, they get the license and also they process everything, while they try to import their machinery and their equipment, our custom law couldn't, didn't know those areas because you know, we are new to, this, to these areas. So as a diaspora agency, we are responsible to compile the existing regulatory frameworks in each specific business areas and also in each specific regions. As a federal government, as a federal system, we do have different laws, laws and regulations in each federal regions. So the diaspora must know that what's allowed, what is not allowed, what, is, what, what potential do we have and what we don't have. So uh, as, as, a, as, as, as an office, whether you are coming individually, whether you are coming as a crowdfunding institution or as a potential diaspora investor, what you get from us is the potential investment areas, the, the areas restricted and allowed, and also the potential target we are, I mean, uh, we, we, we are aspiring to, uh, to work on that. Uh, I think that's all. I, I really wish that all African countries had an office like Mohammed's. <laughs> our jobs would be so much easier. It, 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 it sounds stupid, but sometimes um, when you're dealing with regulators, you do feel like you're disconnected from all the other mandates of, of other government um, ministries, right? To, to support SMEs, to create jobs, to support gender and youth, etc. You, you do wish there was an agency that connected the dots for everyone. Um, okay, so we've, we've understood, I, I think everyone in the room has understood that when you try and create a, a product, an investment product for the diaspora, you have to hold two tensions, two things that are in tension, right? You've, you've got a regulatory environment in the global north that exists, as Johanna said, for very good reasons but which nonetheless impedes um, the diaspora's ability to invest back home. 
that's, that's a problem. And when it comes to getting the diaspora to invest in startups and SMEs, this, this problem is particularly pronounced. The cost of doing so is far too high relative to the size of the investment that is being made in the African SME or startup, okay? Um, so some of the, the, the barriers, the, the regulatory barriers are there, like I said, for good reasons. I'm interested in, in what are the barriers um, that are there which could be removed or the cost of which could be reduced for some of these entities. So I'm gonna ask my panelists to tell me their view from where they sit. What, are, what, what can the stakeholders in the room here, the, donor, the, the grant making organizations in this room, what can they do to help your model scale and to unlock the barriers um, to, to greater capital flows from the diaspora? And I'm gonna start with Alain. Thank you. So for me, I would say, you know, regulation is one of our biggest barrier. And then I will really specify two things, what we call uh, uh, KYC and uh, anti-money laundering policies where we are in Europe. So for, for us, to, just to give you an example, when we started our business, we had to register and then we had to open a bank account. So since our business was related to Africa, so we went to a bank, ING Bank. So one of the issues were like, you guys, you're gonna be investing in Africa. So we, when we look at the current regulation, this is going to be a, a big problem on us. So we cannot open a bank account for you unless you have all the paperwork from the central bank that allows you to do business in Africa. So that was expensive. We spent 50,000 euros to get only that paper. So then, now we have the right to open a bank account. So now we want to invest. So when we want to invest, then again, other issues on anti-money lending policy and then KYC. So KYC is knowing your customer. So we need to give a lot of information about our investors on the platform, and then this costs a lot of money, but obviously now today there are so many softwares, now it's easier. So this was one of the challenges. And then this anti-money lending policy also came back. Since we are investing every year, we need to, to, to explain to the, to the central bank how much money we are investing, who is investing, what is the return, when it's, it's gonna come back. So every, I would say in February, that's when we, we need to, to draw that report to the central bank, and then it's really a headache. And it's only for Africa, so, and Asia to some extent, but it's, 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 it's special to us, and then, uh, yeah, when, and then the other thing, the other issue we have as, as a startup in Europe is our business model. So when we go to private equity investors or venture capital investors, they don't see opportunities in Africa. So we are a fintech. So when they see a fintech, they will say a fintech that can work in Europe. When we link it to Africa, it's very confusing for them. So this for us really from the regulatory point of view and then from the investment point of view, our biggest challenge. Thank you. Got it. So stakeholders in the room, cost of compliance, KYC and AML. Um, and understanding how Alain himself could raise capital for his own platform. Uh, is he a fund? Is he a fintech? Is he European? Is he African? You know, you know these investors have got to tick a whole bunch of boxes and he doesn't tick them all. And uh, we need to do a better job as funds and investors of understanding how to not exclude um, fintechs like Alain's from, from raising capital. Um, right, on to you, Andrew. Yeah, um, yeah as, as I also mentioned, like, you know, some of the, one of the biggest barrier, you know, for Kiva, especially when it comes to transitioning from philanthropy to uh, outright investments is regulation. Um, so, and of course, they, these re regulations exist for a reason, to protect the public and the individuals, because, yeah, we have also started like a uh, parallels fund management business, but it's restricted to high net worth individuals and uh, institutional investors. So, I mean, I've seen some models uh, with, the, with the, I would say, central bank here in Kenya or the insurance regulator here in Kenya where they have set up like regulatory sandboxes to test out innovations. So this is where, you know, some of these uh, mainstream requirements can be lowered for new innovations and 
these innovations are tested uh, to see just how they can work in terms of serving the, the target segments. Um, and, you know, once, once this have been tested, it can be a platform for developing sort of like better or more tailored regulations for these new innovations that can be allowed to scale within this new environment. Now, as a global crowdfunding uh, platform, um, we, we don't necessarily have like targeted campaigns for diaspora communities, for instance, in the U.S., um, because the U.S. is a big market with a very huge uh, diaspora population. So awareness creation is another thing that we would prefer that, you know, if each country can have like diaspora desks in their foreign missions to create awareness of the different investment options that the diaspora have will help. Uh, because as Kiva, we might not be able to reach to all Nigerians, Ugandans, Kenyans, um, you know, in a targeted campaign. But if each of these respective governments could have ways of creating awareness within their, their communities, that would be also be a good help for us. Very well said. So um, I'm trying to think about how I can make tweetable summaries here. Um, but I, I want to say to anyone uh, who is in the um, development space, who wants to support diaspora investment in Africa, if your strategy does not include support to African regulatory authorities to create enabling frameworks, you are wasting your time. Tweetable. Um, okay, let's move on to, to Johannes. Uh, thank you. So, you know, just putting back my uh, development, international development hat, there's a lot of work that's being done by donors, uh, European and American donors, in support of diaspora investment. I tell you, um, my own organization, Ethiopian and Diaspora Business Forum, worked with USAID in, in creating a loan guarantee scheme to de-risk um, lending, for example. And, and most of the diaspora have been out for 30 years and come back home, they don't have a collateral. In most African countries, lending is based on collateral, availability collaterals, right? Um, and most of the diaspora come in and exhaust all of their savings and then they don't have enough money for working capital or for, you know, to keep on going as a business. So the, the loan guarantee schemes through what USAID called DCA, the Development Credit Association, uh, provided 50% guarantee for a fee uh, of the loans. So it was an $18 million facility. I'm happy to report when the program ended, there is a 100% repayment, zero default. Uh, and most of the borrowers paid back ahead of time. Uh, there are other efforts. Blended financing is now in. It's this become a fad, but it's a very important. Uh, earlier, somebody mentioned, uh, I think it was Stella, uh, blended financing is, is now being used to leverage investments. Uh, that de-risking and leveraging allows you to offset your regulatory costs. Um, again, I think just stepping back, the regulatory issues are mostly on the West. Uh, not, in, in Africa, the problems we have are broader issues of enabling environment issues, right? It's redundant regulatory headaches, uh, corruption, and, and so on and so on. But on, on, on the you know, sending side, the regulatory structures, it's a really a cost issue. Uh, if you have the resources, you could comply, you could properly set up the compliance mechanisms and be able to raise the funds. Um, so blended financing, there are a range of, I've been part of uh, at least several of the most recent ones, uh, providing incentives to, to uh, funds, for example, impact funds, uh, first loss mechanisms, uh, to take that first loss risk. And, and, and be able to encourage the funds to invest in, in diaspora investment. Now, the funds themselves, I've, I've worked on an advising fund set up across Africa. They have to be advised from the initial fund set up mechanism because the LPs require the structure, requires the risk mechanisms the way they led. So from the early stages, you have to get involved and, and provide that support. Um, and so on and so on, right? So the biggest challenge are the, you know, the political risk insurance, the you know, currency risk and all those issues 
can be addressed through the, the various now mechanisms that donors are offering, SIDA, uh, uh, GIZ, USAID, um, all of these uh, organizations have a variety of, of diaspora-related investment uh, promotion support uh, de risking mechanisms. Uh, and th they've been very helpful. Now, there's also private sector uh, interest uh, in, in de-risking some of these investments for a fee. Uh, th th those are still developing. Some of them, their regulatory areas are still being worked out. Uh, but help is on the way. Okay. Fantastic. Um, Perhaps because those of us in the, the sort of small deal space, you know, startups and SMEs, um, where there's generally a, a market failure uh, a, across the private capital markets in general, so I'm talking about f funds um, that they just can't serve segments of the startup and SME market because it's, it's not um, affordable for them to do so. In that space, you've got also a market, corresponding market failure of, of blended finance. And in the crowdfunding models that Alain has, um, and uh, Andrew, I think that it's more complex um, for blended finance struggles to get in there, and that um, if we do have enabling environments, and I do include regulatory frameworks in that, um, in Africa, at least we are creating a starting point to formalize what is otherwise quite an informal investment space, and that helps um, these, these larger institutions to, to structure things, because um, they've also got boxes to tick, must be formal, etc. So. Again, that's, I, I want to point that out because the stakeholders in the room here that, that could really, um, that do have the flexibility to intervene in that space. Um, right, and um, yeah, Mohammed, when it comes to, I'm, I'm curious to, to speak to the point around harmonization and collaboration between African countries, particularly in zones like East Africa where there's a strong dynamic um, as, and, a, and a large diaspora. Um, I, how are you working with other uh, East African countries, governments, agencies, regulators? Is, 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 is there a willingness, is there some impetus to, to, to have conversations around harmonization of regulatory frameworks or whatnot? Yeah, thank you. Uh, again, just before that specific question on the finance, I think for the diaspora investment, I think the stakeholders should, do, should work to look for I mean, both internal finance and external finance for diaspora investment projects. For internal finance, I mean, uh, what we are doing is, for instance, all the banks, including the National Development Bank, to be diaspora sensitive in, in its financing packages. Okay, for example, SMS, uh, when it comes to funding uh, small and mi micro business activities, they are not considered in the diaspora in that category. So as an institution, we are pushing them to finance those small and low and uh, medium scale uh, investment projects and to make other private banks as well diaspora sensitive. Uh, coming to the harmonization, yeah, as I said earlier, I think the, the countries, uh, what, 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 what the countries need to do is first to know where they are. Uh, the diaspora issue is not an option for uh, we Africans. It is a must to do thing. Uh, because it's all about uh, financing projects, it's all about employment, and also it's all about uh, having products so that, so that to mitigate uh, inflations and other lack of resources. So uh, we are, uh, we are, there are a lot of uh, initiatives. I think this, these days there are proliferation of efforts. Uh, almost, the, as you know, the African Union considered the African diaspora at the sixth region and also all the regional uh, blocks, the IGAD, the COMESA, and all other regional uh, blocks consider the diaspora issue as one part of their uh, initiatives. There are a lot of packages, for example, in the EGAD the there is uh, a policy harmonization for remittance. Okay, we are participating on that. How can we harmonize our policies so that uh, remittance within Africa can be simple, low cost and safe? And also we are working uh, to, uh, to facilitate the African diaspora investment within Africa, to make African diaspora investment within Africa more simple, okay, not to consider. For example, in the East African community, uh, in the East African community, okay, once uh, the regional bloc is well established, an, a Kenyan diaspora may find very simple to invest in Ethiopia, and the Ethiopian diaspora may find very simple to invest in Kenya. So there are a lot of efforts in harmonizing policies, integrating efforts, and also in calling the African diaspora to act unite. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thanks so much. I'm really happy to hear that. Um, we, we have an agenda within the, the African Crowdfunding Association to harmonize investments, crowdfunding regulations in the five countries um, uh, within the IASRA block, so um, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and Kenya. And um, IASRA is, is one of these, these organizations where you, you think you can go to to have a conversation around harmonization of regulations, but it isn't really necessarily a thing, right? It doesn't have an office. It doesn't, you can't go to IASRA. It's a website. It, it relies so heavily on regulatory authorities having the willingness um, and a sort of a cadence of meeting to actually carry a long project like this. So I'm happy to hear that there's, there's progress in that domain. We're going to open um, to our audience for five minutes of Q&A. Right, we've got one, one, two, three, that's a lot of Q&A. Um, let's start with gentleman in the back. He raised his hand. Please keep it very brief. Thanks. Okay, hi everyone. So my name is Dennis Mavia. I'm the Executive Director of Deshka International, a youth-led nonprofit working to empower communities in Atriva and Kibera. So my question goes to Andrew Cabucho. So if I went to a bank today asking for investment, I can use that money to invest anywhere in any kind of business. And understanding how donor works, some donors will be like, I'm giving this money, but I want you to in, uh, for certain project. So is that the same case with Kiva? Like, do you guide uh, people on how they invest the money they get from you? And if I'm investing $25, let's say, for example, how how long does it take before I get my investment back? And am I getting the $25 or there's some pocket change that I get? So yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so as I mentioned, Kiva works through uh, financial intermediaries. So in between Kiva and the end borrower is usually our financial service provider. <clears throat> and so it's a financial service provider that's actually um, originating these lending opportunities from their network of entrepreneurs. So we don't necessarily dictate how they use the funding. So it's, it, they just go about their day-to-day -day business, generate opportunities, and um, I would say feed these opportunities on the platform. Um, as I mentioned also, the, the lenders or users on the platform we call them social lenders, so they are there mostly to um, contribute to social impact. And so basically on the $25 that they lend, the, the general expectation is that this $25 will be re reimbursed, like the end borrower will make payment to the financial institutions and onwards back to Kiva and back to the lender. Um, so that this, they can have the opportunity to relend that $25. Now, in future, as I mentioned, we are also like looking at ways of providing return on this $25, but with the current regulatory setup, currently we are not able to do that. Thank you. Thanks. There was a question from Almaz. This question is actually to Mohammed. I am very, very happy with what you said. And so on a selfish note, I want to know how um, you are disseminating, for example, the list of investment opportunities for the diaspora. Who gets this uh, list and how do we get access to it so that the diaspora, well, let's say, for example, um, within the African Diaspora Network, Johannes, how can we make this available to the community so that they can actually see it? So my, my concern always is this list exists, but nobody knows where they are and how they can get access. So I love to see how that could be possible. And I want to tie this up to all the other diaspora, ministerial level diaspora engagement officers, because I think this is really the key to take uh, these projects from idea to really for the diaspora, instead of questioning where do I put my money, well now we have an opportunity for the diaspora to invest in. There is one other thing that goes with it. Is it only for Ethiopians or is it open for other uh, um, citizens within the, within the continent? Thank you. Lady in the blue jacket. 
Thank you. Um, Michelle Munemo, I look after Diaspora Banking at Standard Bank, also known as Stanwick, um, in South Africa. So my question is perhaps probably another selfish, selfish question around banking. So if you look at the products that banks provide for Diaspora at the moment, it's your transactional bank account, some savings products, in some instances mortgage financing as well. Um, they obviously do the remittances um, and insurance, so quite a traditional banking offering. And what I just wanted to understand from the panel is what role do you think banks should play in the space that you're in beyond what they're doing now? Um, and here I'm specifically speaking about local banks, not international banks. Thank you. Anyone want to take that question? Johannes? Uh, okay, we'll, we'll take one more from the floor. Lady with the red. You, yes. <laughs> Um, this is for Alan. Hi. Uh, so I'm founder of a company, so Wealth Tech. Basically, so you mentioned that your SPV, the business model, is very much VC-centric. So how do you source your deal flows? And also, what is the exit strategy for your portfolio companies? And have you had any exits? And that's what multiples. All right. Well, Johannes, could you respond briefly to the first question? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's an untapped opportunity, and most of the local banks refuse to create specific products and services for the diaspora and they stick to their usual structures. Uh, it sometimes it's dictated by their central bank regulatory schemes, but there's still a process. For example, you ask for collateral and someone who's been away for 30, 40 years has no collateral, left because of the civil war or whatnot, and cannot borrow. It may have a collateral back in the country for region. Why can't, why, why can't they create a process? Uh, I know the specific example where the diaspora led to this kind of thinking, where the banks started looking at collaterals and credit histories in their country uh, or, or where they lived, and then were able to link and, and, and be able to uh, create a, a, you know, a, a risk assessment process to be able to lend, right? The banks need to see the diaspora as an opportunity, as a business opportunity. They don't see them right now in many African countries. Uh, but like I said, part of the problem is the central banks. They are not also flexible in, in creating the flexibility to allow the banks to look beyond the national regulatory structures, mm. the huge untapped opportunities. Mm. Hashtag exchange controls. <laughs> okay, um, I, I don't know how we, we, we take um, Alain's response and then I think we might have to wrap up. I'm getting eyes from Mauro. No, thank you. So as I said, we are a VC. We use a VC business model. So our exit strategy is five years. So our, our hope is that in five years we will exit. So our multiples are based on, on, on it's 21%. It's just, um, uh, how do we call it, ROI. But these are estimations. So our, 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 our dream, the, the VC business model, is to invest in something with less value today. Let's say we invest in your company, we give you 70,000 euros, as an example. It has zero value, zero value today. Our hope is that with it 75,000, in three or four years' time, your company will grow, will have a certain value, we have 8% in your company, and then we will exit. So how do we exit? We do it in three ways. So we do with corporate buyout. Most of the time, we want to build companies for corporates in Kenya, for instance, that can, where they can buy, or we build a pipeline for other venture capital or private equity in that country. And then that's how we exit. Because what we see today, most startups in Africa go to raise money in the US, not in the local market. So we want to be that player. And then also to tap a little bit on the question she asked for the banks, I think banks in Africa need to move beyond banking. Beyond banking, it means investment. Hmm? So as long as you don't have an investment product, don't come to the diaspora. I am sitting in the Netherlands. I have an investment product in the Netherlands, in my bank account. I can invest on the stock market in the Netherlands. So if I come and bring my money in South Africa, what do I get? I am secure where I am. I can put my money on the stock market in the Netherlands. I'm fine, but what do I get from your product? So for me, beyond banking, we need to go to start developing investment product on the continent. For me, it doesn't make sense that we don't have angel investors in, in Africa. We have millionaires, but we don't have angel investors. Financial institutions in, in, in Africa don't create investment funds. 
that can pull, where they can pull money of these wealthy people to invest in the local economy. We are still banking. Remember that a startup to go for a loan, it will, it will take it three to four years for working capital. But who is providing seed capital? No one in Africa. Because we don't have VC funds and private equity funds. So banks need to go beyond banking. Thank you. Thanks so much. Mauro. <laughs> okay. I think there's one question for me. I'm sorry? There was one question here. Yeah. Sorry, go for it. Okay, uh, I think it's a very practical question from the real practitioners. Uh, uh, almost thank you. Well, the, I think the, need, the relevance, the importance of having an, a government body to uh, specifically focus on diaspora issues is to have to use all the alternatives and all the means. I mean, to work on diaspora engagement. In our case, communicating and reaching out uh, uh, diasporas uh, to disseminate informations, uh, uh, we do it in various ways. You know, first, uh, we do have a diaspora diplomats uh, in most of our embassies. For example, in, in 32 uh, Ethiopian embassies abroad, we do have a, a diplomat that is specifically responsible to diaspora affairs. And the, those diplomats are directly responsible to our office. You know, they took the annual plan from our office and we support them in terms of uh, other issues. So they are the first uh, contact point and they do have all the relevant information that we produce locally, that produce from uh, other institutions. And also we do have, uh, we, we work with various diaspora organizations uh, so those diaspora organizations, for sure, are the, as the contact point for the individual diasporas. Uh, for instance, just last year, we have a recognition program for uh, diaspora organizations, and we recognize more than 52 diaspora organizations uh, just directly by our president and deputy prime minister. So these diaspora organizations are another so contact point for uh, information. And events are very important for that. Uh, again, uh, last year, for instance, we had a homecoming event in Ethiopia. During that homecoming event, we conducted more than 65 diaspora events in different parts of our country with the relevant government bodies so that they directly present what they prioritize, what do they have, so such events and also other uh, publications and the usual media communications are some of the approach we use. Thank you. Oh, may I answer your question? Yeah, well, the, uh, the issue of diaspora currently is uh, it's a kind of between the foreign direct investment and the local investment. So uh, currently, until the regional blocks uh, inaugurate their programs, okay, uh, they, until they launch their package, so far uh, by diaspora means Ethiopian origin. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for participating. Thank you for my amazing panel. Um, we've got 45 minutes of networking, so feel free to continue with your questions. Thank you, Elizabeth. Great job. Okay. What a panel. Thank you very much. Please stay for a photo opportunity. One message for the audience. So we are handing the morning sessions. We are going to resume here at, 12, uh, at 2 o'clock this afternoon for another panel on how it's, a, it's an emerging issue on how we bridge diaspora investment with climate finance. So please come back here in this room at 2 o'clock this afternoon and enjoy your lunch. It should be already uh, there, ready for you. Thank you.